this is a bit of an experiment, but we, we have managed to have, uh, we invited Richard Mayer, Professor Richard Mayer from the University of California, Santa Barbara, to join us at UNSW. And we've also got Professor John Sweller, um, the theory of cognitive load theory, and they've both agreed to join us here today. So around the place we've got uh, over in the Faculty of Medicine, then we've got Canberra, um, we've got a few other universities, Student Life and Learning, and Global UNSW as well. So thank you, Richard, for joining us from Santa Barbara. Um, and I guess the first part we were going to start with, we did a bit of a running order. We were going to start with Professor Sweller, uh, just giving us a brief overview of cognitive load theory. And then we'll, we'll talk to um, Richard and allow him to give us a, an overview of the theory of multimedia learning. And then it's open to the floor, pretty much. I've got a few questions I've sort of thought about already. Um, but I thought if anybody else would like to join in, and the best thing about these sort of virtual hangouts is the discussion angle of it. Um, it's lovely to, to, to have these people here and be able to, to um, ask them questions and get their responses. So, yes, without any further ado, that's my bit done. And uh, John, would you like to get more up? Sure, thanks. Thanks for mine and thanks for organising this and having me along. So, it's like a great experiment. <laughs> <laughs> it is an experiment. I'll, I'll try to very briefly uh, just take a few minutes to outline cognitive load theory. Um, let's, let's start with uh, uh, how we go about acquiring information. We might just turn the aircon up. I think some people are having trouble. Oh, there we go. Is that a bit? Better? Yes. yes. Better for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, let's start with uh, considering how we go about acquiring information. There's the, the basically two general procedures we use to acquire information. The first one, and easily the most important one, is we have evolved to acquire information from other people. <coughs> we're very good at it and we're one of the very, very few species that acquires large amounts of information from other members of the species. We listen to what people say, we read what they write, we imitate what they do. And that's the major way in which we acquire information, and it's critical in all facets of education. Sometimes we can't acquire information from other people, either because the information hasn't been invented yet or we don't have access to the right other people. In that case, we engage in problem solving, and that includes randomly generating moves and testing them for effectiveness. It's not a good way of acquiring information, but it's a way we sometimes have to use. They're the, they're the two ways in which we acquire information. Now, whichever way we use to acquire information, in the first instance, it needs to pass through a limited capacity, limited duration working memory. In other words, the initial processing of information occurs in the working memory that's extremely limited in capacity. We can only handle uh, literally two or three items at a time if what we're dealing with is organising those items, uh, comparing them, contrasting them, uh, processing them in some way. Two or three items is about it. We can hold material in working memory for no more than about 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, almost all of it's gone. Okay. Now, keep in mind what I'm now talking about is novel information. Information that is new to us, that we haven't dealt with before in, to any great extent. 
Once that information has been processed and processed for long enough, it goes into, um, as far as we're aware, unlimited capacity long-term memory. And that unlimited capacity long-term memory in some ways is, is us. We are our long-term memories. It's really, really important. We tend to think of working memory as the centre of our cognitive processes because we are aware of what's in working memory. Possibly long-term memory is much, much more important. We're not aware of most of what's in long-term memory. The only time we're aware of what's in long-term memory is when we bring it down into working memory. But long-term memory is the, in a sense, provides the justification for the education process. If nothing has changed in long-term memory, nothing has been learned. Something's got to change in long-term memory. And once things have changed in long-term memory, we're transformed. Turn into different people. I guess it's a truism to say that education is transformative. Well, the reason it's transformative is because things change in long term memory, and once they've changed in long term memory, we can do things which we couldn't possibly do before. First thing to note is I talked a few seconds ago about the extremely limited capacity and duration of working memory. That's for novel information. For information coming from long-term memory, all those limitations disappear. Both those limitations disappear. There are no limitations on capacity that we know of. There are no limitations on duration. We can bring material from long-term memory, bring it into working memory, and have no strain on working memory at all. So, the ultimate aim of education is to get information into long-term memory. Once it's there, we're changed. That's the basic theoretical context of cognitive load theory. Now, based on that cognitive architecture, we can determine how we should organise instruction. And we need to organise instruction in such a way that we place an em emphasis on getting information from other people. So say we've evolved to do that, to ensure that information, which when we're dealing with students is always novel information, the reason they're students is they're taking in novel information. We need to organise that information to reduce the um, working memory resources that are required to deal with that information. So cognitive load theory has a whole lot of instructional techniques which are concerned with procedures for reducing the strain on working memory and more importantly, ensuring that information, once it's been processed by working memory, goes into long-term memory. That's essentially what cognitive load theory is about. I won't go through the techniques uh, in detail. Uh, uh, I will re-emphasize the point that I've made over the last few minutes. We need to ensure that we present information to students rather than have them try to discover it for themselves. We need to ensure that that presentation is organised in a fashion which reduces the load on working memory. And that's pretty much the central set of issues that cognitive load theory is concerned with. 
might be a good place to leave it there for me. Yeah. So that probably leads leads well on to your theory um, of multimedia learning, Richard, where you've sort of taken cognitive load theory and adapted it to a, a multimedia context. So would you like to run us through your ideas? All right. <laughs> um, well, I have to say it's a pleasure to be here. I kind of feel like I'm with you all, and I have very fond memories of my previous visit to University of New South Wales. A lovely, lovely visit many years ago. Um, well, just to give you context, I'd say over the course of my career, my focus has been on trying to understand how learning works, and in particular, how to help people learn in ways so that they can take what they've learned and transfer it to new situations. So transfer has been at the heart, I think, of both psychology and education from the very beginning, from more than 100 years for both fields. Um, and um, the cognitive theory of multimedia learning is just an attempt to see if we can promote transfer by using both graphics and words to help people understand uh, academic material uh, more deeply. So I've really borrowed, <laughs> speaking of borrowing, which John, John was talking about, I've borrowed three main ideas from cognitive science for this uh, cognitive theory of multimedia learning, uh, what I would call limited capacity, dual channels, and active processing. So limited capacity, uh, John's already really talked about this, this is the idea that people can only process a few things at any one time in working memory. So we can only be thinking about and, and working with a very limited amount of material. <coughs> so even, even if you want to fill the screen with information or put a lot, of, a lot of stuff on a page, people can only process a very small part of that. So um, that's just a limitation on our information processing system. The second aspect of our processing system is what I would call dual channels. We have uh, separate channels for processing verbal material and visual material. Um, uh, materials um, processed in different parts of the brain and it's represented differently. And I think a lot of understanding occurs when we can integrate those two modes of representation. When we can see the relationship between words and graphics that that's a meaning-making kind of situation. So uh, this idea of dual channels, I think, is important if we want to design instruction. And the third idea here is what I'm calling active processing. For meaningful learning to occur, um, the learner has to engage in appropriate processing during learning. This includes uh, paying attention to the relevant material, mentally organizing it into some kind of coherent structure, and then relating it with relevant prior knowledge. Um, now, the, the challenge, I think, for instructional design is that we want all those processes to occur, but we have a system that's very limited in capacity. So we have to be very efficient about the way we present information and prime those processes. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Um, should I keep going a little bit, or? What's the event? I just uh, to develop on that. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. So um, kind of if we want to look at the instructional side of things, I think there are three main instructional goals that kind of fall out of this theory. One is to reduce extraneous processing. Another is to manage essential processing, and lastly, foster generative processing. So let me explain each of those just very briefly. So most of the research in this field is focused on this first one of reducing extraneous processing. I think as John was pointing out, we want to present material in a clear way that doesn't have a lot of, um, it doesn't cause the learner to engage in processing that is not related to the instructional goal. So extraneous processing is processing that doesn't support the instructional objective. So we want to design things so that you minimize that kind of processing. So that means one way to do that is to not have a lot of extraneous material. Just focus on what we want people to learn. Another way to do this is if we're going to have graphics and text, 
put the text next to the relevant part of the graphic it's talking about rather than putting it as a caption so people don't have to scan back and forth. Those are just a couple of, of examples of how to reduce extraneous processing by having uh, a better instructional design. Sometimes um, we can't eliminate material because it's essential. So by essential processing, I mean cognitive processing that's required to mentally represent the material. And this can be overloading sometimes if we have a very, very complex material that can overload working memory. So to manage essential processing, some um, strategies are to do things like segment the material so we just go part by part or to have some kind of pre-training where uh, learners learn the key concepts before we go into more detail. Those are examples of managing essential processing. And lastly, I have, we have uh, fostering generative processing. So generative processing is processing um, uh, that's aimed at deeper understanding, making sense out of the material, um, kind of putting effort, extra effort into um, uh, mentally rearrange the material and, and relate it to prior knowledge. Uh, so this is where motivation comes in and some instructional techniques that might help there are, well, to use graphics along with words, I think is one way to foster generative processing. And a couple other principles we have are to use um, what I call the personalization principle, to use um, conversational language, um, polite language that kind of fosters more of a partnership with the learner. So, I'll stop there and because um, I think the most important part of this is our discussion, but I just wanted to give you an overview. And I will say, okay, this is a bad plug, but if you want to know more, uh, this is the book theory. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that one out from the library at the moment, which it's a... Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll start because I think everybody starts off a bit shy in these things. Um, but I know medicine's got a microphone there that uh, hopefully some questions will come out of and a few others around the place. But uh, I guess I'll start with the questions um, that I had in mind. The first one, and it's open to either John or yourself um, or anybody else, good luck there. Um, what would be your recommendations that people would need to keep in mind when developing multimedia resources? I know you've touched on a lot of the, a lot of the things, but uh, if you could, you know, drill it down to some of the main things that we should consider, because I know a lot of people in the room and out in the faculties are, are involved in that. Mm -hmm. so, do you want me to go first or John? <laughs> Who would like to go first? John? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, there were there were several uh, effects which um, have been studied reasonably extensively with respect to multimedia uh, information. Um, uh, let me just outline some of them. Let's assume you've got a diagram and some text. Let's assume you can't understand the diagram by itself without the text, and the text doesn't make sense without the diagram. That's a fairly common thing. If you've got a geometric uh, uh, explanation, you, you've got a diagram, uh, triangle ABC, and then you have uh, angle uh, ABC equals uh, angle XYZ. Now, neither the diagram nor the statement make a great deal of sense by themselves. It only makes sense once they've been combined. That means you've got to mentally combine them before you can derive any sense from this. It's called the split attention effect. You've got to split your attention between the diagram and statements and bring them together. You can reduce extraneous working memory load by putting the text on the actual diagram or bringing arrows which combine relevant parts of the diagram with the text. In other words, if you can in some way present the material as a single entity, 
rather than two entities between which one has to split one's attention, you'll reduce working memory load. And experimentally, that's been demonstrated many, many times. Let's assume, again, that you have a diagram and text, but this time, that the diagram and text can be understood in isolation. In other words, you can look at the diagram, you can understand it. You look at the text, you can understand it. Sometimes that happens because the text more or less just re-describes the diagram. In that situation, the text is redundant. You don't need it. And again, experimentally, if you give one group of learners both sources of information, another group of learners just one source of information, the people who only get one source of information learn more and better than the people who get both. It's called the redundancy effect. So the logical relation between bits of information really determines what you're going to do with it. There's no rule which says, OK, you've got a diagram, you've got a text, and this is what you do. The relation between the two is important. You might, for example, instead of presenting the text in written form, present it in oral form, spoken instead of written. Now, the advantage of that is, while well, both Rich and I have been talking about limited working memory. Uh, as Rich indicated, really two channels. One of them to deal with, one of them an auditory channel, another one a visual channel. And if you can use both of them, they're not additive, but you get more working memory resources available. And you can increase working memory resources. So, Sometimes it's worthwhile speaking the information rather than having written information. If you do do that, remember, written information is permanent. It stays there. Spoken information is transient. It disappears. What, I'm, what I said a few minutes ago is gone. Okay, if it was in written form, it's still there. If it's a lot of information that needs to be presented in verbal then it ought to be written. We invented writing precisely because it's permanent. If it's a small amount of information, you may be better off speaking. Okay, that's called the modality effect. I might the, the, there are lots of other effects, but they're, they're three of the main ones that deal with multimedia learning. I'll, I'll probably stop at this point, and uh, uh, maybe Rich has stuff he can add to that. Um, I thought that was a very, very good summary. I mean, I think John and I are pretty much on the same same wavelength when we're when we're looking at um, design principles, and I think the main idea here is that. There are evidence-based principles for how to design instructional messages that have words and graphics. And I think there's pretty good consensus on, on how to do this. Um, there obviously are individual differences. Um, John and his students have looked at the role of expertise, for example. So some of these principles work better for novices than experts. And I think most of what we're talking about is for looking at novices. Um, so I, I think it's important to, you know, base things on those principles, but also on our theory of how people learn, because no one, no one is ever going to be able to just say this is exactly how to do it, and you have to do it this way. The reason it works is because it's priming cognitive processing. So it's also important to understand how the human information processing system works. So. In terms of kind of specifics, you know, I, I think I would give the same, basically the same kind of story that John just gave. The, uh, one principle um, that he was talking about in terms of split attention, I have a similar idea that I call uh, a spatial contiguity principle. This is the idea that 
if you have graphics and text, so, so for example, let's say an explanation of how a car's braking system works. You could have a graphic of how the system works, what it looks like before you step on the brake pedal, what it looks like after you step on the brake pedal, and then underneath the, all that, a caption that kind of goes through all the steps. Now, when you step on the gas pedal, I mean the brake pedal, um, it's, a, it's a Toyota, maybe it was the gas pedal. Um, but <laughs> the brake pedal, uh, that makes a piston move forward in the master cylinder and so on. If we take the text and place it next to the part of the graphic it's talking about, so when it says, uh, piston moves forward in the master cylinder, instead of having that as a caption, that text goes next to the master cylinder. And when it says, smaller that the brake shoe pushes against the brake drum, we put that text next to the brake shoe. So by putting the text next to the part of the graphic it's talking about, that reduces extraneous processing because you don't have to look back and forth between the caption and the text. It's much easier to see the connection, um, and it's going to make it easier for people to make connections between the words and the graphics. So I call that spatial contiguity because the words are contiguous with the graphic. Does that make sense? When you do something like that, that greatly improves transfer performance. People are much better able to troubleshoot braking systems, answer questions about braking systems, um, even though they're getting exactly the same words and the same graphics. It's just got to do with how you lay it out. Does that make sense? Another principle that John mentioned is what I call a um, modality principle. Um, so if you have a lesson that has, let's say, gra uh, graphics and, and printed text, so for example, we have a lesson on how lightning storms develop. It's a little uh, animation. Um, and then you could have below the animation kind of running text that explains it. The problem with that is it creates a situation that John was calling split attention because if you're looking at the graphic, you can't be reading the text. If you're reading the text, you can't be looking at the graphic. So in order to offload the verbal part of that um, challenge, we can, we can use spoken text. That will go through the auditory system. So you can use your eyes for processing the animation and your ears for processing the words. So um, when you do that, when you, when you use voice instead of printed text, that improves performance on a transfer test about lightning storms. So that, again, is an example of having the exact same information, but just spoken instead of printed. I don't mean to say that it's always better to have spoken text, because as John pointed out, there are some times when you want the words on the screen, if they're hard to, if they're hard to hear or if the learner is not a native speaker of the language that's being spoken, if there's a lot of technical language, then probably we want more print. And lastly, um, an another example is what I would call the coherence principle. This, this idea is to remove extraneous material from the lesson. So for example, in the lightning lesson, we have little video clips of lightning storms, and we have shots of planes being struck by lightning and all kinds of things like that and all kinds of interesting facts about lightning that actually depresses people's performance on a test. It's much better to take that out and focus just on the steps in, in lightning formation. People do much better on a transfer test when, ex when the extra materials leave it. So those are just some examples of principles. In, in this book I have 12 principles that are similar to that. Well, well, we'll see if we can. Um, Leila over in medicine, does anybody over there have any questions? We'll just unmute you, Leila, if you want to. Does anybody? Yeah, we have someone here. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. My name's Lois Meyer. I'm from the Faculty of Medicine. 
Um, I just wanted to ask about the cognitive load theory in relation to postgraduate students. I work in the postgraduate area and I was wondering, particularly John, in the way that you were speaking before, um, how would you approach a diversity of experiences with postgraduate students in the way that you would organise instruction? Because as Richard was saying, with the cognitive load theory, it tended to be for the novice. But one of the things that happens with postgraduate students is they come in with such a diverse group, diverse experiences. In terms of instruction, some know some things, others don't. It's a very mixed kind of um, group of experiences from which to design learning. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, 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 I can see that's a problem uh, when uh, dealing with postgraduate students. In, in fact, it's a it, it's it's a problem uh, throughout the educational sphere in that uh, people uh, are likely to have different ability, uh, different knowledge base, and. Uh, uh, dealing with people with a vastly different knowledge base uh, can be very difficult because uh, what you say is going to be obvious and self-evident for some people, uh, uh, material that you don't need to say at all, and for other people it's going to be material which is absolutely essential. Uh, 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 one way is to uh, present as a reasonable amount of the material in permanent form so that people can uh, access it and uh, uh, skip over things they don't need uh, to look at in detail and look at other things that they do need to look at in detail. We can do that more now with uh, uh, the magical uh, electronic equipment that we uh, currently have. Uh, in, a, in a classroom where all of these people have been put together, there really is nothing you can do, unfortunately. Uh, uh, you can simply, uh, you know, all you can do is present the material uh, uh, in uh, uh, the best way you can. Uh, you may want to get people to read stuff beforehand so that uh, uh, their background is uh, uh, somewhat more similar. Um, but that's basically all you can do. I, I, I'm aware that the answer I'm giving you is not terribly satisfactory, but I feel that when you've got a very mixed group of learners at any level, it's incredibly difficult. If everybody comes in with a different background, uh, there, there really is almost logically no way of handling that. Every, every classroom teacher would probably agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> every, yeah. So I'm, 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 uh, that, I'm afraid that's the best answer I can give. <laughs> Did you uh, add Sure. Um, I, I think um, medical education is a wonderful field for, for applying uh, cognitive load theory and the cognitive theory of multimedia learning because I, I think People in medicine understand what evidence-based practice is and, and also apply, can apply it to training. So I, I have been very impressed with what's going on in medical education and trying to, trying to make it more evidence-based. Um, I know, I don't know how it works in Australia, but in the U.S., usually the first two years of medical school is pretty much book-based, lecture-based. Um, and... Um, I've been involved in a couple of research studies with um, medical faculty at Northwestern University in, in Chicago. Um, and the first author on, on this paper is, is named ISSA, I-S-S-A. And what, what, he, what we did was to take a lesson um, from a, that was from a course and as a PowerPoint lesson. And then what uh, Dr. ISSA did was to apply all these principles of, of multimedia learning to improve his slides and the way he was presenting the material. So he kind of had the standard way he, he um, gave the lecture one year or one quarter and then the next quarter, the next cohort of students, 
he used the improved version where he, he followed all the all the principles like the ones that we've been talking about. And he found a huge improvement on their test scores, both on an immediate test and on delayed tests. So that is telling me that even with medical students, using these, these principles of how to design multimedia instruction helps at, at least in that aspect of, of medical education. Um, I, I know that further on um, in their training, the, um, the students work more with maybe simulations and even with simulations I think it's important that that they be structured and have very clear learning objectives. Um, so some of these principles would still apply maybe even with simulations but I think that's a, a slightly different research area. I don't know if that made sense. Well we've got a question I, I set up a, a bit of hashtag just to Try something different again, and Natalie, who um, couldn't make it here in person today, she's not feeling well, but she's obviously sitting at home watching the live stream, and she's got a question: What implications does this have for blended learning? Because that's one of the big initiatives with UNSW at the moment. Um, we're talking about blended learning, or a seminar like today, where the majority of learning is. Both. So then, you know, we do have the visual aspect too, I suppose. I mean, where we get to watch John and we get to see other rooms and everything, but essentially most of it is, where, you know, a spoken sort of... Yeah, yeah. But, uh, look, the, the uh, uh, spoken information of the sort we're engaging in here, it, it's, it's important as an introduction. It, it, I don't believe it can ever be more than that, simply because of its transient nature. Uh, ultimately, if you you want to understand the theories and the procedures, you have no choice but to read it, because the enormous advantage of reading is you come across something, don't understand it go back over it again, have another go, think about it. Uh, you can't do that in, uh, uh, at the spoken level. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a good reason why a lot of education, or most education, is, is based on reading and why the first thing that anybody learns in the, in, in the uh, education system is how to read. Because if you can't read, you're not going to become educated. Uh, what about video playback? I mean, is, yeah. is that changing what, what it means to have spoken education? Well, I, I thought the same thing, you know, because, Podcast. well, you know, literally this is going to be available infinitum <laughs> on YouTube. It records it. We'll be able to go back over it. It, it helps immensely. Right. So, yes, it it, it has changed things. Notwithstanding that, it can be extraordinarily difficult to go over things and find the right place to go to. Much easier than in written form. Much easier. Uh, if you're spending your time trying to think, right now I think this was about one third of the way through, let's go through it. You can spend um, you know, this is this was with your limited working memory. You can spend a lot of time trying to find what was said, and then you go over it. It's um, it, it's just easier in written form. Is that because we haven't found good ways to get text media content? So far? I suspect so. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I think, I think there are, there, there's improvements coming in that area. Yeah, if you look at the Linda videos with the uh, mm -hmm. transcription, the, the spoken word is followed by the text that is highlighted while it's spoken, and then you can go back to the text and reread it and also hear it again while it's playing back. But I think there's a big difference between hearing something and interpreting what you're hearing and reading something and, and, and taking that in. I think you. I think you just yeah, absorb that differently. 
Sure. And I think John's also referring to browsing. How do you how do you quickly find the relevant part? Exactly. Would would we do you think you know we absorb it differently because as John and Richard were saying, we have two different channels. So with the reading one, it's more a visual, you know, it's I, I think so. a visual channel where where the um, listening to, you know, watching one of those Linda things is the visual. Well, it's a boat, isn't it? It's a bit of both, but yeah. But yeah, I, th I just think that we absorb things quite differently if we're, if we're listening to something as opposed to if we're reading it. And and I think every individual is probably a little different in how they absorb it and understand it. Look, you're right, we do absorb things differently, but keep in mind that probably the main reason that we absorb things differently, well, first we absorb things differently because we've evolved to listen. Uh, we uh, we don't teach people how to listen. Uh, they know how to listen. We've got to teach people how to read. They don't know, you know, unless you explicitly go ahead and set up a society which teaches people how to read, they won't know how to read. Uh, that's not the case with uh, listening. It's uh, uh, the difference is what we call biologically primary and biologically secondary. Biologically primary is something we've evolved to learn how to do, and uh, Listening is something we've evolved how to do. We haven't evolved specifically to read. We can do it, but we have to be taught it, and uh, uh, we learn things differently uh, through the biologically primary system and the biologically secondary system. And uh, uh, reading and listening uh, belong to those two different systems. So, yeah, there, there is a difference. But a large part of the difference. Is the trans is still the transitory nature of uh, of listening. Um, even if it's just a short sentence, you've got to make sure that by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you still remember what was at the beginning, and you've got a limited working memory. Not so important when reading, because you know it's just there. You know, you've forgotten the beginning of the sentence. Just go back to it. Uh, even with technology. You can go back to the beginning of the sentence. It's still difficult and clumsy. True, sure. I agree. It, particularly if you have some sort of extended. Jump back again. There we go. We, 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 every now and again we freeze up, but it, it's to do with our Wi Fi. Here. So we've got a, a question from Canberra, and we've got a question here in Global. Everybody's got questions now. Here you go. <laughs> the discussion. So, uh, Fiona, did you want to ask your question? I'll just unmute you. Oh, you're right. Oh no, we can't hear you. Did you want to type yours in? Uh, I'll try Elizabeth. Did you have a question? Um. That one's not working. Leela. Yes, can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, our question, my question is about uh, assessment. And I'm wondering to what extent is cognitive load theory relevant to assessment, especially assessment for learning, formative assessment, and um, part of that formative feedback? Okay, uh, in the last five years uh, we started taking much more notice of assessment than we certainly used to. And one of the reasons for that is uh, the so-called testing effect. 
And the testing effect goes as follows. If you um, teach people something, and then for, in an experiment for one group of people, go over it again, another group of people, give them a test on it, you find that the people who've been given a test do better on a subsequent test, in other words, a second test, than the people who went over the material twice. So testing is really, really important from the perspective of learning. Testing people does improve learning. Uh, now, there's some evidence that may only apply to relatively simple material. It's early days yet, but uh, on the evidence we've got right now, uh, we've tradition well, we've traditionally used tests to grade people to find out how much they know. That's not the only function. It turns out that if you test somebody, they'll actually learn more as a consequence of being tested than they would by going over the material again. I, I don't know whether that answers your question, but that's one of the issues associated with testing that uh, we all need to keep in mind. Testing is important. <laughs> what that means is that it's about where testing is actually provided. provided you should uh, uh, testing yourself is important. Okay. Um, we've got another question here from um, Canberra. Uh, it's an interesting one because her colleague couldn't couldn't be here, but he's actually doing research on um, using both your theories. Okay. Um, so the question is from uh, David Meacham who would have liked to be here today, I'm intrigued at the role of images in forming schemata, if I said that correctly. Professor Mayer, in relation to your research with Claudia Leopold relating to the imagination effect, can you comment upon the power, advantages, if any, of learner-generated images versus those provided by instructors? Sure. No, I think this is a good follow-up to uh, John's discussion of the testing effect because what we're seeing with the testing effect is that taking a test can be a good study strategy and I think we're beginning to see a lot of interesting study strategies that um, can improve learning. Um, I think we got, I think Claudia and I got interested in imagination uh, kind of following from research on drawing which shows that if you're reading a scientific text and you ask someone to create a drawing that corresponds to it, so for example how the human circulatory system works, um, that can improve learning if you do it in a very um, kind of structured, scaffolded way. And then the next logical thing is to ask to someone not to draw but just to imagine what an illustration would look like. So if you're reading a passage on how the human circulatory system works, can you imagine you know, the four chambers of the heart and, and how the lungs interact with that. So I, I think what, you know, what Claudia and I have found and others have found is that the act of imagining can be an effective study strategy. It can help you um, understand the material more deeply, partly, I think, for the same reasons that multimedia presentation is effective. You're, you're combining the words and pictures, trying to make sense out of them and see the relationship between them. And if you're successful, if, you, if it's structured enough that it's successful, then I think that can promote learning. I think very general instructions to just form an image are not as effective as more um, prescriptive instructions for what should be in your image and how, and how it should look. Um, that kind of ensures that people are going to be more successful. And I know John, John and his lab have done a lot of research on imagination also. entirely with uh, what Richard's uh, just said, let me just add one, uh, one point. Um, uh, with respect to the 
imagination, uh, well, treatments have to be with respect to the imagination effect. You can get it with visual material, but you can also get it with auditory material. In other words, we found that uh, it doesn't matter what type of material, imagination can be useful. That's the first thing. But secondly, uh, more directly, if you, you, you get what we call an expertise reversal effect with the imagination effect. Uh, this is how it works. Um, if, if you give people something to imagine and they're able to imagine it, then asking them to imagine it is uh, highly beneficial. If, on the other hand, they can't imagine it or they have difficulty imagining it, then you're better off presenting it to them. Okay, so, so going directly to the initial question, should you present the material or should you get people to imagine, the answer is both depending on the level of expertise. The imagination effect will not work if you give people something to imagine and they're really struggling to imagine it. In that case, present it to them. Okay, uh, it looks like we've got another Twitter question. Uh, so other people, there's other people watching it about the place. Uh, question for John. In ESL context, how useful are subtitles on videos in English or, or translation? Uh, subtitles, yeah. Um, again, this, this is a... a expertise reversal issue as well. Um, if, you're, if you're presenting material to native speakers, you should not use subtitles. Okay, we've got a lot of data out there that if you present the same material in both written and spoken form, it's worse than just presenting it in spoken form or just presenting it in written form. Right? For ESL students, on the other hand, uh, they're, they're not experts at the language. It may be beneficial to present uh, subtitles or um, written information, assuming, and again the question then is, uh, what language do you present the uh, written information on? Um, depends on the level of uh, knowledge. Uh, levels of knowledge are absolutely critical in this field. They change everything. That's uh, you know, what I said right at the beginning, once something is in long-term memory, you are changed and the instructional procedures that are needed also change. Uh, so. It's not just a question of ESL. It's at what level of the uh, 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 what level of knowledge do the students have? Would you like to add anything there? Well, uh, I think this is a really important practical issue. We've we've studied this a little bit in our lab, um, trying to look at um, college college courses that are taught in English for. Um, students who are not native speakers of English. So for example, looking at um, s students from South Korea who are taking a, a course that's taught in English, what, what kind of, what are the implications for instructional design there? So one obvious thing would be to add subtitles um, in English to the English lecture that's going on. We have found in our research that that didn't help, but it didn't hurt either. So and there may be something more going on than, than that that we have to look at more deeply. One thing that kind of is interesting is if you have a, a lecture that's mainly a verbal lecture, adding video or graphics helped, um, helps Korean students when the lecture was in English, but it, it didn't help them when the lecture was in Korean. So. Um, there's something about adding graphics to an English lecture that might be useful for um, someone learning in a second language, I think. It's not ex kind of the opposite of um, subtitles, maybe. Yes. All right, there's another question. Um, this is from Lisa. 
from Santa Barbara. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> so I'm curious um, if cognitive load theory has implications for people instruction via think, pair, share. For example, does interacting with a peer increase the cognitive load because of particular goodness or attraction? My peer instruction be helpful because it requires learning how to learn automation. situation on the data we've got, you're better off learning individually. You may not like it as much because we like being in a social situation. So in effect you have to uh, decide, well look, is the motivational aspects of being in a social situation, do they, uh, are they more important than the cognitive aspects of, which are clearly indicate you learn more by yourself. And you, you, you have to uh, balance those two because clearly it's not just a question of saying, okay, cognitively you learn better by yourself so you should never learn in a collaborative situation. Collaborative learning can be important if it uh, motivates people uh, uh, in the longer term. So that's an ambiguous answer, but best I can give it presence. <laughs> And Richard, did you want to add to that? I'm conscious. I'm getting conscious of the time, and it's it's past oh, yeah. over there in Santa <laughs> Barbara. Good but, point. So, um, I, you know, I, I agree that um, collaboration is you know seen as a 21st century skill. It's it's if you ask employers what they're looking for, collaboration is always one of the top quote, skills they're looking for. So I think it's important to look at this, uh, and when it, when we're looking at it in terms of instruction, I think we've got the trade-off that John was talking about. Um, collaboration can promote, I think, foster more generative processing. It, it might be motivating, and it might encourage people to put in more effort, but at the same time, it could create extraneous processing because a lot of the interact there's a lot of interaction. Um, elements that might not be really focused on the instructional goal. So I think there's a trade-off, and to me that suggests that we probably want a more structured kind of collaborative situation where 
people know know what their roles are, what they're supposed to do, and are um, are able to be more productive if, if they're gonna um, gonna collaborate. I I do know from research in our lab that explaining what you know to somebody else can be a very effective study strategy. So building explaining to other people into it, um, I think could be a really useful thing. Okay. So if, if you've both got time, because we've still got a couple of questions here in the, in the feed, um, is video and multimedia that, that sophisticated? I would have thought it is possible due to surveillance techniques. Oh, actually, that, that was probably refers to something before. I'll ask this one. What are the enhancing effects of art and music in relation to the to the understanding and retention of factual information? The enhanced. If the factual information concerns art and music, yes. If it doesn't concern art and music, no. <laughs> It depends. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether the, the factual information. You, you, if, if the question is, should you be listening to music while studying English or mathematics or something? Mm. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so if, 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 if the factual information is concerned with music, that's obviously an entirely different question. I had seen, I, I don't know whether, I'm not sure whether the question is referring to it, but you know, you, you do watch uh, uh, clips, YouTube clips or whatever, or even shows on television, but you know, like the David Attenboroughs and things like that, where, you, where you're actually watching something, you know, that you're learning off, but they do have a, a music score underneath that, that it sort of would enhance that experience um, in a sense. You know, I wonder uh, whether that has an effect. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Look, can, can I can I make a comment uh, concerning um, the sorts of shows you'll see on TV or in the, in the cinema, and the sorts of material that is presented, say, in a educational context like a university. They're different, uh, and they're different in the sense that. Cognitive load theory deals with information that is difficult to understand that imposes a cognitive load. Not all information imposes a cognitive load. If it doesn't impose a cognitive load, different sets of principles apply. Now, almost by definition, people don't make, let's say, documentaries or shows which are going to impose a cognitive load. Uh, it's uh, they won't be able to sell them. So the, the, the there's a different set of principles that apply to information that you're going to get watching a television show to the information that's presented in uh, uh, certainly in a tertiary institution. So that, that that's an important distinction. Yeah. Richard. I, I totally agree with what John's saying. Um, we, we've done uh, research in our lab adding uh, background music, for example, to a lesson on how lightning storms develop. Just an instrumental loop that's pretty low key. That, that detracts from learning um, because I think it's extraneous. If you're paying attention to that, you're not paying attention to the lesson. Um, adding really nice graphics that have nothing to do with the lesson also is distracting and causes people to um, perform more poorly. Putting in kind of background environmental sounds like wind and ice, that detracts from learning. Um, the, the problem is if people are paying attention to those things, they can't be paying attention to the content. So I, I, I agree that there's a difference between entertainment, when the goal is entertainment, and when the goal is to inform. When the goal is to inform, we have different, different principles. Does, it, does anybody have a question? Yeah, can I ask, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about graphics. Can I ask because many of us are recording multimedia content, uh, 
a very loose notes to dynamic annotation. So many of us will be writing as we as we present and record a material. Uh, is that different from static graphics or are the principles essentially the same? Uh, 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 the, the use of animation is sorry for annotation, not annotation. Oh annotation. Sorry. Annotation. Sorry, in that case what Oh, so, so you'll see many videos where there's explanation that they may have pictures of the presenter or they have pictures of slides, and then there's annotations on top of that. So oh. mark up the slides as they, as they present, for example. Circling or writing. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but not rewinding exactly what they're saying. Could, perhaps or not, but I'm curious about, about the principles of the I don't know any research on annotation while its oral material is being presented. I would have thought it was it was redundant, and I would have thought it would have negative consequences. But uh, I'd have to look, you know, at precisely what was being done. Well, I'm coming from an engineering perspective, so there'd be some graphical content and then you do some sort of derivation based on that, I guess. Look, if, into geometry. If, if you've got graphical content and you're saying, look, have a look at this particular part of the diagram and then you mark that particular part of the diagram, so that, that's fine. Yeah, I, I call that the um, signaling principle, so it's the idea that when you have visuals like a animation or a video or even a still diagram and you're talking about it, it's helpful to guide the, the learner's visual attention. So you can do that with arrows, but you also could do it with annotations. So um, you have to worry about redundancy because if you have too much text that's the same as the voice, then I think that can be distracting. But we found in our research if it's just a word or two and it's next to the part of the um, system we're talking about, that can actually help learning. So like in the lesson on how a car's braking system works, even though it's a narration, still putting um, piston or master cylinder right next to that element actually helps as they're watching the animation. I think you just don't want to overdo it. Just just have one or two words that signals where you're looking, um, we found that's effective. I don't know if that answers your question. All right. We've got one more question from Medicine, and then we might wrap up, because I'm very conscious of your time, Richard. Um, so, Leela, do you have that question? Leela? I'll, I'll just unmute. Uh, oh, here we go. No, you're not coming through very well. No luck? Oh, that's better. Okay, it's Gary Veland here from Medicine. Yeah. Um, John's cognitive load theory has informed us a lot in, in how we develop our teaching. Uh, I'm just interested in, with regard to trends overall in higher education, particularly inquiry-based and problem-based learning, according to cognitive load theory, can, in, uh, can those methods of, of uh, learning work efficiently, particularly in information-rich fields of study. Okay, that's, that's an absolutely critical question uh, and a highly controversial one. On all the data we've got, if you're dealing with novices, don't use inquiry learning. Once people become reasonably knowledgeable, then what you find is that the differences between inquiry-based learning and explicit instruction decrease as expertise increases, the differences disappear as it increases further, 
after a while, inquiry learning is better. It's a, it's a classic case of the expertise reversal effect. We, uh, whether, whether, whether inquiry learning is going to work depends on the expertise of the learners in the particular area. Uh, if you're dealing with novices, my strong suggestion is don't use inquiry learning. But you can use it as people become more knowledgeable. John. Thank you. All right. Well, we might we might wrap up there. I know I think we've taken enough of both of your time, and then it was really enjoyable hearing both of you speak. Um, and lots of questions coming in. It was great. So our little experiment sort of worked. Yeah, well, I guess. Right. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll keep keep trying with this idea. Uh, well, thanks for coming, Richard. My pleasure. Great to have you here. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you for thank you for coming. Thank you for organising this, Brian. And it was good to see you again, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> <It was> wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Brian. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Thanks everybody for coming around uh, all the other campuses too, and and uh, George and Lisa from Santa Barbara as well. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.